tell you that, that my talk ha has no financial support in relation to temporary anchorage devices, but they did ask us to disclose our other research interests. Um, none of this will really influence my, my discussion this morning with you. Um, we're talking about perio-ortho collaboration, and there are many different aspects of care that we can deliver for this. I'm going to be concentrating on um, the third, and that's temporary anchorage devices. That article that Dr. Uh, Wagenberger talked about was the, one of the first articles in the periodontal literature about using TADS, and it was a commissioned uh, review case kind of a technique article to, to help educate periodontists on utilizing anchorage devices in collaboration with the orthodontist. Uh, I'll refer to some of the things in this article, but I would strongly recommend if you're a periodontist reaching out to the orthodontic community to share this article with them because it helps them understand all the different applications of TADS uh, in, their, in their practice. The, the, the obvious thing we're trying to achieve here is, is move some teeth by, but not moving others. Uh, and when we're using teeth as anchorage, it's the, the age-old problem of, uh, of the equal and opposite force being created. Um, the teeth that you sometimes ask to be used as anchors are going to move too. The solution here uh, is, is a, an orthopedic type of anchorage device that can potentially eliminate headgear, uh, maintain incisor position when we're extracting teeth, provide impressive intrusive forces otherwise not being able to achieve with traditional orthodontic therapy, uh, and, and at times accomplish things that we could not accomplish previously without orthognathic surgery. Temporary anchorage devices have really evolved over the last 10 years with many different styles, uh, many different orthodontic connections. For myself, uh, we, we really ask the orthodontist what they're looking for in regards to the, how they're going to be connecting to these devices. Certainly today, uh, they're a lot more common than they were just five, 10 years ago, but they're still underutilized in orthodontic treatment. Uh, they can be used as adjuncts to what our previous speaker uh, talked about in regards to PAO. So utilizing TADS and PAO to accomplish the desired outcome. Somewhat of a paradigm shift, as Dr. Cope referred to in one of the first articles ever published on TADS, is that this is a paradigm shift for orthodontists. And you, we need to understand that as we're collaborating with them on how these can be best utilized for treatment. But as periodontists, it's an opportunity for us to further collaborate in multidisciplinary care with our orthodontic colleagues. It's certainly not a novel approach, uh, orthopedic anchorage. Uh, for, for years, this is a case uh, 12 years ago where we used uh, an integrated implant in the palatal region to create uh, absolute anchorage for anterior retraction. You can see in a case like this the incredible amount of uh, retraction of the anterior segment with the molar segments remaining stable through therapy. The literature is replete today on, on the use of temporary anchorage devices. Uh, this is just uh, the one page of, of five where we've done a literature review in regards to TADS in the, in the literature. This is a very recent, uh, pulled these from the online um, application of the orthodontic journal, uh, and the one I'll just read for you, I know they're hard to read, Mini Implants in Orthodontics, a, a systematic review of the literature, and then a five-year experience of orthodontic uh, application of mini screws and, and, and how they can be used and what their success rates are. And I'll just tell you that even though they've, they're, they're in the literature, every orthodontic journal you pick up will have something about TADS. Uh, conclusion of that systematic review is many implants can be used as temporary anchorage devices, but research is still in its infancy. So we're just starting to really understand uh, how we utilize these, and it need, you need a very innovative orthodontist to, to somewhat change the, the, the way in which they're thinking to utilize these properly and most efficiently. We also know for, for endosseous dental implants, they can be very valuable in our orthodontic cases. Here's a case where we had a, a very aggressive periodontitis in an individual which we controlled with traditional periodontal therapy, then went through uh, implant placement in the indentula sites. As you can see from x-rays, it involves some bone augmentation in posterior regions. And then these endosseous dental implants will be used as anchorage units to lessen the force on the anterior dentition that's most compromised by the periodontal disease. So this is prior to orthodontic therapy, after periodontal therapy. The implants have provisional restorations in place to be used as anchorage units. 
And you can see here the anterior segments are not really, it's more of a segmental orthodontic treatment, working off the implants in the posterior region to up, upright second molars and also get a better canine relationship to create canine guidance to prevent the undue forces on the, on the incisors. You're seeing here just it, during the orthodontic therapy utilizing uh, the implants as anchorage. Um, those aren't open margins. That's the coping that place, that's placed on the solid abutment of a Stroman fixture. Um, and, and it works out quite nicely. Uh, we're getting a much better canine relationship in this progress display. Um, canines now are, are going to help us keep the, the tremendous forces off our incisors. And here you can see prior to orthodontic initiation and then towards the tail end of orthodontic care. And this is how she finishes, still in a temporary restoration in the lower anterior because she's going to lose teeth numbers 23 and 26. And from a standpoint of, of aesthetics, this patient's extremely happy. We had discussed the removal of the maxillary incisors, but if you look at her um, in smile, this patient was very happy to maintain those incisors at the age of uh, just 36 years old. So a tremendous amount of disease, uh, and by utilizing anchorage units, we could keep, keep those incisors as they would have been, it would been very difficult to bring those units through orthodontic therapy. Here's the, the cases we're going to go through rather quickly now. Uh, and the reason I'm showing this is more of the article that I referenced. Uh, the orthodontist provides the different spatial relationships that, that need to be addressed from anterior, posterior, uh, to transverse, um, or whether it be certainly just a dental problem or a perimeter problem. Uh, the first case I'm going to show you is a case that presented to us for implant placement. They had substituted the canines into the lateral incisor positions uh, and left an edentulous area in the upper left bicuspid. But as it presents to me, we're presented with a, a problem here where there's root proximity and a buccal deficiency in the apical region. As I discussed, bone augmentation procedures, the mother would not have it. So we went back to another orthodontist, and what we decided upon was segmental orthodontics to close that space from the posterior with the use of a temporary anchorage device. So certainly not an ideal outcome for the patient, but a very innovative use of a temporary anchorage device to accomplish the goal for the patient. So we're simply going to place a, uh, a one temporary anchorage device. When we first started doing these, we would, we would sometimes elevate a flap. If the orthodontist asked for this TAD to be very close to the canine, we felt much more comfortable uh, elevating a flap to, to best understand the root proximity. Two weeks later, activating. And then very slowly, you can appreciate in this panel of moving that arch around. But one thing we found out here is that there's, there, there needs to be some considerations for reciprocal forces. And we switched the, the anchorage from the buccal to the lingual to pull that arch around. And we'll just go through the sequencing of finally closing the space. And ultimately, we've closed the space, but we still have some significant asymmetry in the aesthetic view. We're going to have a wax up completed. In the day we take the temporary anchorage device out, we're going to perform some crown lengthening, mainly in the bicuspid areas for future bonded restorations. And here she is just three weeks post crown lengthening. She goes off to college and uh, has yet to return for bonded restorations. But uh, a compromise, certainly, from probably really desiring to keep those canines in the proper position and placing implants in the 7 and 10 positions. But we intervened with this case far, far too late for that. Second case I'll show you is one that presents with uh, uh, needs for posterior retraction, a uh, young man that's been in orthodontics for years and not compliant with headgear. So as he presents to me, we have limited space in the incisor position for implant placement. This is how he started before he ever got to me. You can see we've got a significant deep bite, uh, congenitally missing lateral and a peg lateral in the 10 position. And this is back to where he actually entered our office for the replacement of the congenitally missing tooth. 
but we still do not have, uh, we've got an end on canine and molar relationship. We need to get that upper arch back to sock in a uh, class one canine relationship and thus develop the space in the lateral incisor position for an implant and a restoration on a peg lateral. We utilized two temporary anchorage devices in the palatal region and worked off those with the transpalatal arch. And within four months, we can see here significant uh, retraction of the posterior teeth and then bringing the anterior teeth back to create space for implant placement in the lateral and a restoration of the peg lateral. Here we are further analyzing the edentulous area for implant placement. We're going to be planning here to remove the temporary anchorage devices, place an implant with a little apical grafting in the seven position, and do a little bit of gingival recontouring on the canines and the peg lateral. Eight weeks later, we're doing a provisionalization of the implant. And this is how the case finishes with also some bonding on the cuspid. Next case, a very, very, very innovative approach for a TAD. This patient has been in a removable partial denture for most of her life. Uh, and you can see the significant over eruption of the mandibular incisors. Uh, so we're going to just use one temporary anchorage device to begin intruding that lower segment. And in five months, we've created a proper restorative space, but we still have an issue with the under-erupted number seven. So she'll go into maxillary orthodontic appliances, and this is just showing the progress of the case, all ending up with not only gaining the, the restorative space, but bringing the, the gingival margin of the incisor down. We're going to move forward now with augmenting the anterior segment for implant placement and this is how she finishes up with just one temporary anchorage device uh, to bring those incisors to their proper occlusal plane. Another application of intrusion here uh, from a very jumbled occlusion, as you can see, with over eruption of this segment here with a retained primary tooth. In time, in 10 months, with two tads in the palatal region and two on the buckle, we're able to intrude that segment and go from here to here in just over 10 months. Now she'll go on to reconstructive therapy in those edentulous areas. This is a classic example uh, taken from Creekmore and Eklund back in 1983 where they used a fixation screw for intrusion of the maxillary anterior dentition. You can see this is how she presents before phase one orthodontic therapy. This is her getting ready to go into orthodontic therapy before the use of a TAD. You can see a significant uh, overjet situation. First, we have to consider not only the, the, the placement of the TAD, but an aberrant frenum. We have to deal with that. So we've done a laser phrenectomy here, and we'll place one temporary anchorage device, a la Creekmore and Eklund, and work off of that one TAD here, we're getting ready to start, already opening up that bite and getting to a situation like this where now the orthodontist can take over to a line. Just in retention now, and this is how the case finishes out. Significant. Uh, Nice job of retracting that anterior segment as well as uh, um, taking away the, the, the very significant overjet that the patient presented with in a before and after. The lateral stuff really shows the amount of retraction needed there. Posterior intrusion, this patient is a retreat case where this is how she presented post-orthodontic therapy. All the occlusion is in the region of the second molar on the left-hand side. So we're going to use two tads, one buccal and one lingual. To intrude this lower left segment. This is progression here. 
complication here is the buccal tad starts to become mobile. As you can see here, it's being pulled, but we've already gained significant intrusion of this posterior region, and the patient finishes out with a nice reduction of the anterior open bite and a more stable occlusion. Another case of retraction where a non-compliant non headgear patient, uh, we just solved this with the placement of two TADs in working off a transpolital arch to retract the posterior teeth first. Here we can see we're just locking in this unit to push the posterior teeth back. Once we've got them back, we go from here to here to maintain the molar positions and retract the anterior segment. And here's how the patient finishes out with a little bit of post-orthodontic recession that we uh, treat with a gingival graft. Two, two next cases as I finish here are really innovative of what we're doing today. Uh, this is a case, another post-orthodontic case with a uh, relapse of an anterior open bite that will not go through surgical care to, to close this bite. I can't tell you how this is going to work out, but our plan here is to put place TADs in the molar segments and then work off Invisalign to intrude the posterior segments. So there's TADs on the buccal and in the palatal region and buccal and lingual in the molar regions to work over the Essex retainer or the Invisalign retainer. This is how we'll plan these cases today with a three-dimensional analysis so that we can obtain accurate measurements of the uh, area for TAD placement, even a close-up here of measuring the mid-palatal region of how much bone we have. Three-dimensional analysis cer certainly serves us very well with cases like this. You can see that very early on we la lost our palatal TAD within the first month and went to two TADs to continue our intrusive forces, and I'll have to report to you later how that case is, works out. Here we have an innovation here with an incredible uh, orthodontic problem with over eruption. The, the, all the occlusion is on tooth number three. A lot of orthodontic issues going on here. We sit down with the orthodontist and models and discuss where he'd like these anchorage dev devices placed, uh, and we're going to intrude basically the entire left hand side with TADS. Once again, using a three dimensional analysis to, to plan this case, to gain accurate measurements in the inner root areas for TAD placement. Here's the placement of the um, six TADs on the left side of the mouth and the progress film just taken last week of where we're at starting to intrude and align uh, the dentition. Another case of intrusion of a posterior segment where we've got limited restorative space for an implant reconstruction and with the, this is pre-treatment pre Again, limited space here, placement of two TADs, one buccal and lingual, to that molar segment to intrude and gain the restorative space we need to ultimately perform our dental implant reconstruction. An incredible open bite case here where we have vertical and skeletal problems, accomplishing with just two TADs in the palatal region, intrusion of the posterior segments, as I talked to Dr. Hildebrand this morning, we obviously we're not just intruding, we're also getting some eruption of the anterior segments, but these anchorage devices are given nice stability in the molar segments. And here you can see the result of closing a, a very uh, significant open bite. And I'll finish here uh, with a combination of temporary anchorage devices and PAO. Uh, in a case that most of us would look at this and say there's no way we're going to accomplish this without orthognathic surgery. You can see here we are preoperatively coming in to uh, perform our PAO in the anterior segments. We're also going to perform an osteotomy through the extraction site in our first after closure and the first 10 days of healing. We're going to use a distraction device to begin the movement of that lower segment and on our next film here, you say we're not only pulling the anterior segments back, but we're maintaining molar position with the placement of temporary anchorage devices. Here we've kind of skipped over the anterior area, continue to progress along. In 20 months, it's certainly not a quick case, but we've come from here to here.
And here we'll see the end result. So by using these two innovative approaches, we're able to bring a patient from a significant class three skeletal malocclusion to a, a very nice improvement. In conclusion here, as I mentioned at the, the onset, this is an opportunity for periodontists to further collaborate with orthodontists and expand our scope of practice, uh, become surgical leaders and educators on using anchorage devices for absolute anchorage, improve the standard of care in orthodontic therapy by becoming surgical leaders and teach, teachers of this modality. We try to load these as soon as we can to avoid any circumferential different uh, muscle tension on the temporary anchorage devices. So we, we would very much like to load these immediately with a very light force. The complications that you'll see in the literature uh, are, are these screw fracture, fracture I've never experienced, but certainly mobility. And when they become mobile, there is inflammation and pain involved, and we need to be careful of, of damaging vital structures. Su success criteria is based on picking the right site, using the right implant for the orthodontist and really for the anatomical limitations.